Rachel. Um, as we always do, we're just going to chitter and chatter for a few minutes while we wait for all the people who've registered today to um, tune in to today's webinar. We've, um, we've actually been surprised, as always, by the amount of registrations that have, uh, that have been made online through our website, so it's very good. A well overdue topic today, the, uh, the, the topic of how to buy a, a brokerage or second-hand or pre-owned yacht in Asia, uh, something that we have been talking about internally for a long time, about needing to just un undo some of the unknowns around that space. But we will just hold a minute and uh, let all the registered participants join us, and then we'll uh, move on and, and start today's webinar. Uh, with us today is Paul Stamp, who is sitting in our uh, Thailand Phuket office. Hello. And also with us today is Patrick Gillo, who's sitting in our head office there in Malulaba. Hello, everyone. Okay. We've got a few people clicking in there, so we might just start uh, moving forward. We'll just click to the next slide. While we're waiting for everyone to join in, we'll just remind everyone that you can... Uh, easily go back and look at a number of the webinars that we did. The, the webinar uh, program or the webinar concept for multi hold solutions and the Yacht Sales Co was came about at the start of COVID way back in uh, around about April of um, 2020 when Rachel and, uh, and myself and a few of the other people in our team were working out how do we stay in contact with our, our wonderful um, um, database and, and client base. And it was decided we should start doing webinars. So we did a number of them during 2020 and also 21. And then we sort of felt that they were getting a little bit tired. Um, so we sort of pulled the brakes on. But then we have decided that over the coming months, we're going to just do a couple more because there's some specific topics that we need to, uh, to focus in on and, and, and get on paper, as they say. So we need to all have a chat, record it, and then put it up on YouTube. You can go on our YouTube channel, uh, which is either the multi hole Solutions or the Yacht Sales Co. The multi hole Solutions YouTube channel is the one that has all the webinars. And you can see now that there's, I think there's about 25, but what's really impressive is the number of views. Uh, so by having this product or these webinars as a product and a resource on YouTube, it's been very helpful for us to the point where people are contacting us, talking about a boat, and we can just redirect them and say, go and have a look at that webinar. And they come back and go, wow, that was helpful. So make sure you do go and have a look. The next webinar in this series will be one to talk about buying a brokerage or, or pre-owned boat in French Polynesia in Tahiti. And we'll also incorporate into that some discussion about buying a boat from our new uh, office location, which is Fiji which we've only just recently opened. Is that right, Patrick? Correct, yeah. Okay. Throughout the webinar, you are quite welcome to ask questions. Uh, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, you'll be a, or top of the screen, however it sits on yours, is a Q&A button. Uh, if you open that up, you can type your question. We will endeavour to either answer the question as we're going, if we feel that it's relevant to where we're at in the discussion, or we'll hold it over to a Q&A session at the end, or we will um, hold it over and we'll come back to you directly via email with an answer to your question. So there, you, you, but rest assured, any questions that are asked, as long as they're, they're, they're logical and fair questions, any questions asked, we will respond to. Okay, so my name is Greg Boller. I'm the, the New York Sales Manager for um, for multi hole Solutions and Yacht Sales Co. And assisting us today is Rachel Crook in the background, who's our group marketing manager. And uh, Rachel has done yet a, another wonderful job of putting together today's presentation. So thanks for that, Rachel, in the background. Okay, our presenters. So first of all, today we've got Patrick Gillo. I think a lot of you, if you've watched any of our webinars before, have probably already virtually met Patrick, or you may have actually met Patrick at many of our boat shows. So Patrick, do you want to just introduce yourself, please? Yes, sure. So um, uh, thanks, Greg, for the, uh, for the introduction. Um, 
yeah, been in charge of the used boat sales there for Multi Health Solutions and Yacht Sales Co for quite a few years now. And before that, uh, involved uh, overseas with uh, shipyard manufacturing catamarans. So, uh, yeah, overall, probably over 20 years of, uh, of experience in, in the marine industry, which I'm more than happy to, uh, to share with uh, everyone here, uh, uh, specifically your team there around as well, all the brokers. So, uh, um, yeah, happy to uh, help with any particular uh, questions that uh, you guys may have. We had a presentation some time back about uh, buying a boat overseas in general. So uh, uh, these these are uh, thanks to uh, the, the the background there from Europe and everything, and the foot we've got uh, with the partners overseas as well, other brokers, we can help uh, uh, all of you there looking at uh, boats overseas. Very good. And then if we just uh, flick over the page, Paul Stamp, welcome, Paul. If you'd like to just maybe say hello and uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, so um, I arrived in Phuket um, 18 years ago. Um, I came in working for Sunsail um, as a charter captain and a, an RYA instructor. Uh, since then, I've worked for four or five uh, boating companies in Phuket, um, covering yacht management, uh, sales of uh, both uh, motor yachts and sailing yachts, um, and even up to uh, super yacht sales and management for, uh, for the Fraser Group um yeah so it's been a very very busy couple of years which uh, we'll move into shortly but uh that's me and i'm again here to uh, answer any questions both on new and used boats from uh, asia so i'm heading up the two offices we have in uh, phuket uh and in uh, singapore we have a wonderful office down in sentosa at one degree 15 and also, we've just uh, recently opened uh, a new facility in the Philippines, which, uh, again, we'll touch on shortly. Thank you. Well, Very thanks. good. Okay, so today's webinar, the, 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 the thing that gave, uh, that made us or motivated us to, to do this webinar is that we, Patrick and I, were with Paul in the office in Thailand, maybe just four or five weeks ago. And the, we realised that there's a, if you go on the multi hole Solutions or Yacht Sales Co. websites at the moment or look, look at our brokerage listings, the, the place where there is often the most listings is Thailand, is, is in Paul's marinas, uh, thanks to the hard work of his team to generate the listings. But what we then find is when we talk to our brokers in our own network, so our own team members, even within themselves, there's this concern or fear about how do I help someone buy a boat that's lying in Thailand if that client is in New Zealand or Australia or, or somewhere else in the world. People are a little bit nervous about the idea of how do I buy a boat that's not in my home territory. And those of us who know, know that it's actually not that difficult. And not only that, there's the added advantage of, wow, we've got yachts that are listed for sale in one of the most beautiful cruising grounds in the world, whether that be uh, Phuket and Kangna Bay or whether that be uh, Tahiti or Fiji, why not buy a boat in one of those locations, maybe even go and use it and sail it there for a while before rushing to get it back to your home country. And, and it's often in our own business, we hear our brokers talking to someone about buying one of the boats that is listed for sale in, in Thailand. And the, the discussion just always goes straight to how do I ship it? How do I get it here? How long does it take? when maybe the discussion could be around, would you like to spend some time sailing in Thailand before you ship the boat or relocate the boat back to Australia? So that was what was the emphasis for having today's discussion, was to maybe just help people understand a bit more about the benefits uh, and, the, and the, the, the processes behind buying a yacht that might not be located in their home country. Would you agree, Patrick? Yes, this is exactly... Um... The case, I think, uh, instead of uh, rushing uh, uh, the boat back into your home country, whether Australia or any other, and rushing the boat into paying taxes right away, why don't you uh, enjoy the boats in her location? Most of them are in pretty nice uh, positions around the world, so uh, you may as well take advantage and see uh, what uh, under what circumstances. 
Can you keep on cruising uh, uh, in, uh, in that location? Can you get any service there on site? What are the, the, the challenges with taxes or anything? How long can you stay? So uh, all this, I think, needed to be uh, addressed uh, for people to make the uh, educated uh, decision. Very good. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, folks. And Paul especially is going to lead that discussion with all of his experience. Uh, so we'll move forward. Um, why did that not work? Just bear with me. Ready? Try again. There we go. Okay, so this is a picture of the growing multi hold Solutions and Yacht Sales Co. office network. Uh, obviously, we've got our, our established offices all across Australia uh, and, in, and our colleague Dominic is doing a wonderful job down there in Auckland. Uh, we've got New Caledonia uh, with Jill up there. We've got Fiji that has just opened recently, Tahiti, which we've had now running for a number of years. But today is about Asia. So, Paul, can you maybe just explain what's going on and you know, what, what the office arrangement is in your part of the world? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I'm based in Phuket, as I said uh, earlier. We've got uh, two very nice offices in Phuket. The head office is uh, based in Phuket Boat Lagoon. Um, and the second is uh, based in Phuket Yacht Haven on the North Shore, where uh, our senior broker, Charles Robinson, uh, runs this office here. Um, we've also got a very nice office in Singapore, as I mentioned, uh, at One Degree 15, which is headed up by a Singaporean guy, Daniel Au. And uh, very recently, we've uh, just opened a new office in uh, the Philippines. So, uh, yep, yeah, it's, uh, it's a thriving market and um, quite interesting how some of the sales have developed because during the two years of COVID, uh, we found ourselves having a lot of Australian interest um, and, and they were rightly very cautious about um, buying a boat when they weren't able to get here so we've done many many uh, video walkthroughs and we're actually still doing those as a as an initial uh, inquiry but during COVID that's how we were selling boats and even selling um, the boats and having a video linked to the survey which uh, a lot of our buyers were very very interested in. Even sea trials we have had uh, some sea trials done right. over the distance. Yeah. Um, yeah. But no, the business has absolutely thrived during COVID, um, which you know many industries throughout the world have uh, have suffered. But um, we've we've just about hit the fifty mark since the first of January twenty twenty one. Just from the Phuket offices, we've sold fifty boats, which uh, is fantastic. Yeah, and it's good. It's good to spread the numbers because volume equals experience. So it's great. Okay, so stepping across. Paul, do you mind introducing your team to us, please? Because, yes, and, I, and, I, and so the reason I say this again, I had a client the other day who, who sort of thought that maybe all we had was a tin shack on the beach up in Asia, and that's why we said we had an Asian office. People don't understand the extent or the, the established size of our, our business in Thailand, so hence why we want to let everyone know who the team is. Yeah, so I've obviously already introduced myself, but... Uh... We also have Charles Robinson, very, very experienced broker, who's actually currently just on his way back from Langkawi, having just completed another sale uh, yesterday. Um, Charles has a wealth of knowledge and uh, an excellent broker. He really, uh, he really does well. Uh, Kevin Quilty. Kevin was uh, the founder of Sunsail in Southeast Asia. Um, an incredibly experienced person to have on hand. Uh, Richard Klein. Richard's one of our new brokers. Richard's uh, half Swiss, half English, and uh, he's learning the trade well, and he's already uh, well on the way. He's, I think he's sold four or five boats already since his start. Um, on the Thai staff, we've got Yui. Yui is our administration manager and does an absolutely sterling job, as you can imagine, with those numbers of boats. Um, her hands are, are always busy. Um, and also Yuk. Yuk's very experienced too in the uh, in the marine industry. She's held many, held many uh, previous positions, and uh, she uh, assists very well with the uh, brokerage listings. Now, an important guy who we have uh, on board is uh, Nat. Nat is uh, my service manager, um, especially when we have a new boat handover. Nat's there to uh, 
assist with warranty matters, um, you know, and commissioning the boat before we hand it over to the clients. We all, and it should be noted as well, Nut's also a fully qualified uh, captain. So we often use Nut on their deliveries, moving boats from here to Langkawi, to Malaysia, to Singapore. So he's a real good uh, guy to have on hand. Um, the final two, uh, Charlotte Cruz is our uh, new manager in uh, the Philippines, who I had the pleasure of meeting last week at the uh, head office in Malulabar in Australia. Welcome on board, Charlotte. And uh, Daniel, oh, sorry, we don't have a, a picture of Daniel. He's uh, not the best looking lad anyway, but <laughs> Daniel was uh, heading up the office in uh, Sentosa in Singapore. Um, and Daniel's a very well-known uh, individual in, in Singapore. And uh, he's had a, a very good start to life working for uh, multi hull Solutions and the Yacht Sales Co. in Singapore too. So, yeah, we've got a, a, a quite a young team, apart from me and Charlie. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's exciting times and I wish them all the success for this year. And I think it would be also important because there'd be people who are watching this webinar who've been involved with our business in Asia for a number of years. They're probably going, well, hang on, where's Andy? So I think it's important to just bring up that Andrew De Bruin, who obviously started multi Hold Solutions up there in Asia and then uh, worked with Paul and, and the team over the years, Andrew is now in our Brisbane office. So if you're looking for Andrew, he is still with us, but he is now managing our Brisbane office in Australia. So you can tap into him there. I think it's important to say that because people are probably going, where's Andrew? Yeah. Sorry about that, Andrew. <laughs> He's probably watching this now. So um, this slide here is just about buying a new yacht in Asia. And this, this webinar is not really about that, but it is to say that amongst that team, uh, we have people who are skilled and knowledgeable on all of our new yacht brands, whether that be Fontaine Peugeot sailing catamarans, whether that be Fontaine Peugeot power, whether that be Jew 4 sailing, whether it be the, the uh, absolute uh, power yachts, Neil Trimarans, the Cora Cat, uh, the Tesoro. So we've got so many uh, great brands in our stable now even to the fact that I think we forgot to put an FP sale image there, but, um, but there's heaps there. And Paul especially uh, is able to talk to anyone about buying any of those New York brands uh, from any of our Asian offices. So there they are there, the brands. What time is Joe? Sail and Power, Glean, Cora, Ju4, Neil, Ocean Voyager, Iliad, Rapido and Stealth. So we've got a good stable of brands and it's growing all the time. But the main purpose of today's discussion is to talk about buying a pre-owned, call it secondhand, uh, call it brokerage yacht in Asia. And one thing you'll notice today uh, is that the discussion will be, will be rather uh, Phuket and Thailand centric. Uh, that's because that is where we buy, we do sell and the, the most turnover of boats in our, in, in our business occurs in the brokerage space. But that doesn't mean we're not happy to discuss with anyone that wants to know about doing the same thing in, in Philippines, in Singapore, in Malaysia. But uh, So ask questions, drop us an email. But today we'll probably be a little bit Thai-centric, but, but we'll talk about the overall cruising area as well. Okay, so here we come to the nuts and bolts. So we're talking about buying the pre-owned boat in, in, um, in Asia, Paul. So... Yep. Maybe if you could get started with a little bit of background there about about Thailand. Yeah, so Thailand, as I said, Phuket in particular, it's uh, it has become the hub of uh, boating in Southeast Asia. Indeed, during COVID, we had uh, many many uh, super yachts kind of en route between Europe and Australia. Um, I think at one time the Yacht Haven had nine super yachts uh, stranded, all in excess of seventy meters LOA. So. It's uh, it's definitely a very popular destination to go to. And, uh, you know, we just want to try and advise people about, you know, the facilities, the cruising area around where we are. And just in uh, Phuket alone, we have uh, five marinas, one of which is uh, completely for the day tour market. But the other four marinas are very nice, well-equipped marinas with great facilities. Uh, I think you want to click the next and then slide. I, I think right, you can. That's fine. So, so then yeah. the, the big discussion that we had yesterday when we were doing our, or over the last few days, putting this presentation together, Paul, was that we, 
there's so many questions around foreign flag vessels and, and the flagging. And so if I'm from New Zealand or Australia or England and I want to come to Multi Hole Solutions and buy a boat that's in Phuket, how does it all work? So first yeah. of all, foreign flag vessels. Yeah, well, a foreign flag vessel, i.e. a boat that's flagged the uh, UK or BVI or Australia, um, all foreign flag vessels have a length of stay in certain countries. Now, here in Thailand, they are entitled to stay here for six months, but then they can uh, extend that quite easily for an additional six months. So I've uh, put Thailand down for one year. So any foreign flag vessel is allowed to stay here for one year. The people on board, however, whether it be an owner or a captain, they are only entitled to a, a 90 day stay. So those people need to uh, check out, do a visa run, if you like, to a, a bordering country. Some go to Burma, uh, some go to Malaysia, some have a weekend down in Singapore. But uh, essentially, the, the foreign flag vessels have one year in Thailand. Yeah, and they can go with the with the boat or go there uh, uh, themselves on a plane or other mean of transport. So the boat could stay for this amount of time and yeah. they may have to leave themselves to be in accordance with their visa yeah. or leave with the boat and take the opportunity to go somewhere else and then come back. Yeah. I think another important um, point to raise here, Greg, is that um, the name, whoever checks the boat into Thailand is responsible for checking the boat out of Thailand as well, either them or someone with power of attorney to do so on their behalf. So that's... Uh, Quite an important point moving forward. The so same let's, people. Let's focus on. Let, let's focus on that for a minute. So what you're saying is, if if Joe Bloggs brings the boat in, comes into your office and says, "Look, I've just sailed from from the Maldives. I'm I'm ready to sell my boat." You go, "Great, let's list it." You then have to instruct them that when it comes time that the a sale occurs they or a power of attorney of theirs has to be present. So the new buyer can't just take the boat and sail it away. No, they, they cannot, a person cannot buy a foreign flag vessel while it's visiting Phuket. And it's a very common question for buyers. Why is the handover port in Langkawi, Malaysia? And that's the simple reason behind that. So at the moment, I've just introduced it to Charles and to Kevin. They're both on their way back today to Phuket from Langkawi, having both completed separate um, pre-owned boat sales. Um, so, you know, our brokers are down there quite often. And it's, you know, the ideal scenario is for the buyer and the seller and the broker all to be in Langkawi. And it's a pretty seamless, straightforward process, which takes half a day. So let's talk about that. So first of all, from the, uh, let's say an example of one of those boats that's been sold, yep. was listed for sale and was lying in... Uh, Okay. In your marina in Royal Phuket yeah. Marina and, and um, Alpo Marina, I'm sorry, um, in your marina. And then how long does it take to get to Langkawi? How far away is Langkawi? Uh, Langkawi is 130 nautical miles from Phuket Boat Lagoon. So it's a day sail um, for a sailing boat. Uh, power boats can do it anywhere in between four and 12 hours, depending on how fast you want to go. But 130 miles there. Um, and it's a, it's it's a nice ride down. It's a fantastic cruising ground in between Phuket and Langkawi. So, do you find that it, often that would be where um, the boat that is selling, that the the seller of the boat and the broker, as in Charlie or Kevin or yourself or whoever, would go together on the boat down to to Langkawi? Yeah, that's definitely the easiest way is for uh, all three parties to be there. It's not essential, but it's, uh, it makes it a, a much easier, seamless process. Whether we go on the boat or um, some buyers fly into Langkawi, uh, the sellers usually take the boat down themselves. The broker, if we have time, will go with them. If not, then uh, we'll fly. Okay, very good. So, uh, yeah, so basically Langkawi is the is the... The, the transaction point. Yes. I mean, you know, boats can be, the odd boat can be sold in uh, in Phuket, but, you know, you have VAT implications, which are, are very complicated. Um, and also you've, um, you know, the power of attorney issue where you have to appoint someone to uh, to move the boat. But 
you know, at the end of the day, a foreign flag vessel should be sold outside of Thailand. And when that comes time, when you're sitting there in Langkawi and you're then doing the finance, final transaction and the contracts, it's all, and Patrick, this is probably you, you to help with this, it's all done on a, exactly the same form of, of yacht sale agreement as you would be using if the sale was happening in, in say, Australia. Is that right, Patrick? Yes, we, um, we actually use some international forms from the, the in International Yacht Brokerage Association. And uh, uh, these are the standard forms. And yes, you sign them uh, uh, one country and you can uh, finalize the deal uh, uh, in another uh, without any uh, issue. And we do this uh, uh, all the time from uh, the 50 boats that uh, Paul was uh, talking about, uh, uh, the vast majority would have gone through this process. And then just, and I know that we've spoken about this before, Patrick, in uh, the, the webinar we did about buying a boat overseas where we focused in on Europe. What about the financial transaction? Like the buyer is obviously going to be concerned about, oh, hang on, where's, where am I paying into? Is it secure? The seller is obviously wanting to make sure that the money is going to come to their bank account. So how do you manage that with these Asian uh, transactions? So we, we have... Uh, 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 um holding accounts in all the different currencies that uh, may be needed, naming uh, US dollars, euros, uh, 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 Australian dollars, Kiwi dollars. So uh, this can happen. We've got facilities in Singapore, also uh, uh, in Thailand and uh, in Australia with a head office where the money can transit. So these are dedicated accounts, same as an escrow account, dedicated to the sale. So no one touches anything and the money remains there for the time of the sale. No one touches anything and it has to be released uh, uh, under the terms of the agreement, either refunded to uh, as a deposit or paid towards the boat as uh, is uh, notified in the contract. And with the invoicing and everything, we use security measures with all our invoicing so that if someone is about to pay money uh, that the account details are validated to make sure there's no um, you know sometimes where an email goes from there to there and somehow it gets intercepted and changed so we've got lots of um, security well, in place. I think this is a very very good point I mean the the, the frauds are uh, intensifying everywhere around the world with the flow of money and wire transfers. So we have taken some very strict measures using encrypted uh, ways to send the invoice, confirming with the passcode, and we don't send any money before uh, we have a second way of uh, uh, authentication for uh, uh, the destination of the funds. So there is uh, uh, an increasing risk. So we have to take any uh, measures there. So some clients sometimes find it frustrating because uh, we are calling again to confirm and everything, but this is obviously for uh, the safety of their own transaction, their funds and uh, the payment. So uh, it is absolutely necessary. That's why I strongly discourage today people to do this uh, outside of the box with wire transfers overseas. It is a, a, a proper real threat. Okay, then the transactions occurred in Langkawi, the, the dealers, uh, sorry, the, the broker is there, the seller is happy, the buyer has now taken possession of this lovely new boat. They, they, they can obviously insure it just like they would if they had purchased the boat in Australia or New Zealand. So insurance can be arranged. Then can they then just turn around and sail back into Thailand and have a nice couple of months of sailing, Paul? Well, it depends what they want to do with the registration at that point, because um, for argument's sake, they might have uh, bought a, a BVI registered boat and uh, they may want to take it back to um, Phuket with uh, a different registration. Um, they might want to import it into Thailand and pay 7% VAT, but, uh, you know, the majority of people in this region, they uh, enjoy 
registering with the Langkawi flag. It's very, very simple. It's uh, very, very reasonably priced. Um, and then they can go back into uh, Thailand or sail on to other destinations um, as a visiting yacht. and gives them uh, another 12 months back in Thailand. Or, you know, we've just uh, recently sold a 70-foot motor yacht to an Australian client. And uh, he actually sorted his Australian registration out while he was in Malaysia. So. Yeah, no. uh, it could be on the next slide, but we may as well talk about it now. Patrick and I were talking about this yesterday. So, for instance, everyone that most of the people that are buying Fontaine Bajos off myself as an example and doing a factory pickup in France, in France, they will, uh, when they arrive or in the process in the weeks leading up, will organise with AMSA and, and register and, and set up their Australian flag for that boat. So when they pick that yacht up from La Rochelle in France, they sail away with an Australian registered vessel on the understanding that they only have to pay duty and GST to the Australian government when that vessel arrives back into Australian waters. So we were talking about that again. You, you mentioned the Lake Cowie flag, but if it was an Australian buyer or a New Zealand buyer as an example, there is no reason why they can't, from the time of the transaction, by going through the right paperwork, they can transfer the flag registration of that vessel. Let's say it was an English vessel, and they can transfer it into an Australian flag and sail around Asia with an Australian flag without any penalty. Yeah, and then just, my understanding is right, only... It's, it's not really um, a transfer. You don't transfer anything there. You just change. Change. So you buy the boat and you uh, deflag the boat to uh, whatever it was in the past, and you add your own flag. And, and I agree, I think the easiest is to go with the flag of your own country, because then everything matches, doesn't raise suspicions there wherever you cruise in. It all, uh, uh, you are, uh, uh, yeah, as you said, a Kiwi with a New Zealand passport, Australian with your Australian passport, Australian flag, everything matches. Thank you very much you go and those flags are very well uh, how, uh, received around the world. How, how do you deflag a boat, Patrick? Well, uh, uh, this is part of the sale process and this is what uh, we assist with uh, when the, 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 the boat changes hands and you become the happy owner of that uh, new boat there for you. Um, then we need to initiate the D flag, so the D registration process. We usually hold some funds off the, the owner of the boat to make sure that this happens because you can be the owner of the boat, but if you don't have the registration under, under your name, you won't be able to go anywhere. So these are two different things. Uh, you need to uh, be the owner first. So there's uh, the bill of sale for that. And then uh, with this bill of sale, you'll be able to register the boat, but you need also the D flag certification, which is the paperwork showing that the boat is no longer registered under the previous flag. With those two documents, then you will be able to register under your own flag or the flag of your choice. And the or, other thing- Or you can- here. Sorry. Or you can just keep sailing with the flag that the boat was previously flagged under, correct? No. No? no, no. Okay. No, no, no. Uh, the flag is tied to the person who is registering the boat, who owns the boat. So uh, uh, in all those cases, well, unless, yes, say the guy had a UK flag and you are a UK resident, then this is when you can do a transfer. It will be under your name, though, so there is... A process there to do, but uh, it will remain under the same authority. But uh, in in a lot of cases, it is a proper change completely. And there's only one thing I'd like to add, if you if you allow me. A lot of people uh, uh, have the wrong perception that uh, the registration is tied to the taxes, and uh, it will, but only as Greg was saying, and I'd like to emphasize on that only when you bring the boat physically into your own country. Until then, you have the flag of your country, but you don't have to pay the taxes. So this is what happens to most of our clients uh, in Europe there for new boats, but used as well. So they happily cruise with their beautiful flag from home, 
but they haven't paid taxes and they won't until they bring the boat uh, back home if they ever do this. And the term there is domicile. It's about where you are domiciled. So where, even though- where, where, where you're a resident and where you pay your taxes. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's good. I think we'll keep going. We'll probably trip over that subject a bit more as we go along. So we'll, we'll just move along. Reset, resetting the clock. Um, Paul? Yeah, I mean, resetting the clock, Greg, I think we just uh, need to touch on, you know, when your uh, initial six months stay here in Thailand, you have to report to the Harbour Department and, you know, obtain an extension. But when your year is up, um, it's time to go. You uh, you must check out at a specific date. Um, otherwise, you go into an overstay situation. There is a way around that, that if your boat is under maintenance, um, you can apply for an extension to that year. But it obviously means the boat is immobilized. It can't be moved. It's on the hard stand having uh, shaft realignment or whatever uh, the situation. But uh, yeah, when the time's up, you have to check out. So they check out of Thailand. They sail down to Langkawi, as an example. They check into Malaysia. Um, and then the following day, or even the same day, they can check back out of Malaysia and come back, check back into Thailand, and they have another year. Okay, very good. Um, oops, sorry, just move my mouse. On. Impact on the sales transactions. Yeah, I mean, we, we've touched on that a little bit already. Obviously, if uh, uh, someone lists their boat with me as a foreign flag vessel, um, the impact on the sale is that, you know, the, the, the ideal scenario is having the buyer, the seller, the boat and the broker all in Langkawi for a seamless, uh, a seamless sale. But um, I just wanted to flag that uh, being a foreign flag vessel on stay in Thailand, there is an impact on the sale. And that's why we have the handover port being in Malaysia. Okay, so listen, we've got quite a few questions coming in. I'm just going to pick a couple of them off now because they're relevant to where we're at. <clears throat> uh, one is from actually one of our colleagues, Mark Hodgson. So thanks for the question, Mark. He says, is there an extra charge for the buyer if they can't get to Thailand? No, no, but there might be a process that we need his authority to undertake um, something. Uh, so we would probably have to ask them for a power of attorney document um, signed and sealed so uh, we can act on their behalf with a power of attorney. And then uh, Nathan asked a question that Patrick's already answered, which is duty and GST does become payable as soon as the boat enters Australian waters. I actually don't think that was a question from, uh, yes, it was a question. Um, and then um, just while we're there, do you inherit the tax liability if VAT or GST is not paid by the original owner? Do you understand that? Well, there's something very important that you uh, take into consideration here, uh, uh, indeed. So that's a good question because um, if the boat, uh, well, it depends on, on, on a few countries, but I'll talk about Australia for now. Uh, uh, if the boat it has paid taxes uh, in Australia, moves to, um, to Thailand, and uh, uh, Another Australian buyer comes across that boat, wants to buy it, buys the boat, brings the boat back into Australia. The rule is, even though it may not seem logical to some of you, that's the rule. <laughs> we know it uh, very precisely. If the boat changes hands overseas, whenever it comes back here into Australia, it pays taxes again. Wow. So really the only way to avoid this would be for the boat to come back under the same ownership as she left Australia and then the transaction happening in Australia. So that's very unlikely because it would mean that the the I mean it depends if the, the owner doesn't mean doing the, the 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 delivery, especially if he has paid the taxes. We had the example there not too long ago of a of a nice boat. Uh, in Asia, who had paid taxes in Australia, and I advised him, I think you will have a massive advantage if you put the boat on the market in Australia, because this is where the tax pay becomes uh, attractive to those who want to buy the boat. Otherwise, if the 
Again, the, the change of ownership happens overseas. The taxes will be due again. Very good. Very good. Very good question. Thank you, Mark. Uh, no, I think it was. And then, um, oh, okay. This I'm, I'll mention this question now to you, Paul, but you might actually want to go directly to this client afterwards. But it's just saying, would a Thai resident have to pay tax on a Lankawi flag boat if bringing it back to enjoy Phuket waters? I might leave that one for later. No, I can answer that. I can answer oh, okay. that now. Uh, yep. if, uh, so if a, if a Thai resident um, has his boat, uh, Langkawi registered, he comes back into Phuket um, as a visiting yacht. He doesn't have to pay any tax. Okay. There you it's go. quite simple, but he has one year to be here. I mean, the only reason, the main reason people uh, Thai register a boat is to use it commercially. Yes. Which, you know, is a completely different entity, but... Um, uh, that's the only reason. Some people with an eighteen-foot runabout, like a little bayliner or something, yeah, they they would have their little boat tie registered and pay a seven percent uh, VAT. But for a, a Phuket resident bringing a tie registered boat, a, a Langkawi registered boat into Thailand, there's no tax to pay in. Okay, and we've had some other questions there, but we're just going to hold them over to the uh, Q and A at the end. Yep. But I think so far, gentlemen, this is good. I think we're covering what I, I'm sure a lot of people are wanting to, to, to learn about. Uh, folks, if you're out there watching this and you think we're not touching on what you want to know, please just type in the question in the Q&A uh, section. Sorry. Okay. Changing country flags. We've talked about that. I don't think we have to go on to that. All right. So, Paul, over to you now to have a bit of a chat about your facilities in Thailand. Yeah, That's so... Awesome. This this is a picture of uh, the office where I'm based, uh, along with uh, Yui, um, half of the week Yuk, and uh, Richard Klein is also based here. This is in uh, Phuket Boat Lagoon, uh, one of the uh, earlier marinas on the island. Um, so yeah, just looking at these four pictures. Um, the Boat Lagoon is uh, the top, the main picture on the top row. Uh, very nice marina, Thai owned, Thai managed, um, great hard stand. Uh, good restaurants, good retail, beautiful apartments and villas. It's uh, it's very nice. Um, our second office is uh, based on the uh, Yacht Haven, which is the uh, the left-hand side uh, image on the bottom row. This is where uh, Charlie Robinson is uh, is located. That um, land you see in the distance is actually Pang A province, which is... Uh, that's the uh, a waterway between the two uh, islands. So that's the mainland, and Phuket is the island, albeit they are joined by a bridge. Um, the next one in the centre on the front row is uh, Aupo Grand Marina. Now, just a point of interest, Yacht Haven and Aupo Marinas are um, accessible 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So these two marinas are more suited to uh, super yachts. So um, they're not restricted by tide. Correct. Whereas uh, the final uh, marina, Royal Phuket Marina, is uh, the very close neighbour of uh, Phuket Boat Lagoon. They are both um, limited um, by tide. So uh, usually you have uh, a good window to get in and out, but uh, depending on your your drafts, your keel length, um, there is some restrictions. But uh, Four very good marinas. They're all very full, albeit having sold a lot of the boats to Australia, they're uh, they're emptying and um, there's odd berths available now. And my, from my experience, uh, Alpo Grand Marina, which is the one in the middle at the bottom, if you're looking for a marina that is closest to the cruising area of Peng Na Bay, that is probably the, the one that gives you direct access. Yep, yep. I mean, Aupo's on the northeast uh, corner, so it's right at the entrance to the National Park of uh, Pang Abe. Very, very good marina, very well managed. Um, but it's uh, it's a bit of a drive to get there, but you're straight out into the park, you know, and a lot of people go and just sit on their yacht and admire the view from that marina. It's beautiful. Very good. Services? Yep, there's uh, a lot of services available, uh, especially in three of those marinas, um, a lot of contractors uh, from expat community um, 
whatever you want doing to your bolt, you know, it can be done. I would say up to 40 meters um, is is possible for a haul out in Phuket. Um, great uh, contractors from electricians to gel coat to fiberglass to carpentry engineers. Uh, we've got the lot. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of Australian, there's a lot of French, a lot of uh, British um, owned companies. Um, and I think you'll find it from recent experience, uh, some clients found it uh, a lot cheaper than uh, than Sydney, for example, where they were taking their boat to have their work carried out. And uh, on the whole, they were pretty impressed with the work that they had carried out. So yeah, there's uh, there's a lot of services, not only in uh, in Phuket, but also up in, uh, in Padia, Chambury, at Ocean Marina, which is the, the fifth main marina in Thailand. Um, but also, you know, there's uh, great facilities in Langkawi, um, even uh, other marinas down in, uh, in Malaysia, in Pankor, for example, um, and down in Singapore. But uh, I think for value for money, I think Phuket uh, offers very, very good services in comparison to, uh, let's say, Singapore and Sydney. And I've stepped back one because in that picture there of the Phuket uh, Boat Lagoon Marina, the top picture. Yeah. You've got the slipway there and you've got the travel lifts, you've got yep. the all the marine services, but right beside it, with you know, 200 yards away is a very nice hotel. So it's yep. not yep. only that, it's a great place. Your boat's being worked on, but you've got a great hotel just right right there. Yeah, and they've got three travel lifts. I think they've just uh, last year bought their third travel lift with a load of 120 ton. Um, so, you know, it, it lifts boats from like 100 feet LOA. Um, but if you want something even bigger, you know, you can drive down to uh, Trang and Saturn and they have lifts down there now, 500 tonnes. So there's a, a lot of equipment and uh, a lot of services available. Yeah. Okay. And then facilities in Thailand, shipping and export and skipper delivery. So just before you go there, I did have a question there from one uh, client, by the way, is... Um, uh, do, 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 um, rough cost of delivery of a used catamaran from Asia to Australia, say Sydney. So I think you're going to go across a couple of examples. Yeah. Um, I mean, the skipper delivery cost, you know, on a, on a basic 40 foot uh, sailing boat, you know, we've, we've seen costs in between 20 and 30,000 Aussie dollars. You know, it does vary. I think a lot of Australian buyers have their own Australian captain. Um, but there are many, many delivery teams here in Phuket. And uh, recently we've had uh, boats delivered um, by some of our own uh, skippers going to Singapore, to the Philippines, even to Taiwan, uh, Jeju in South Korea, Bali, uh, and down to Australia and beyond. So there is uh, the skipper network, but again, it depends on uh, the level of the captain that you want, and it depends on the size of the boat. Um, you know, uh, regarding shipping, uh, I mean, the major shipping companies of the world uh, coming to Asia, usually around uh, Thailand, we, we use uh, Seven Stars and Peters and May very often. Uh, Seven Stars have got a, a very good service where it's a water to water, so they can literally um, plonk the boat into the water, as uh, in this picture. Um, with spreader bars, nice, safe into the water, start your keys, you drive out the slings and in, straight into the marina. Um, so that's it, it stops a lot of the uh, the headaches of having to go to a container port. Um, locally, we've got Port Klang in Malaysia is the nearest, um, and Singapore as well. Uh, a bit more red tape, and... Uh, but it's a, it's a more frequent service on the container ships. So that's a weekly service from uh, the UK and from uh, France to Southeast Asia, whereas the Seven Stars water to water on a crane, um, they're usually around four a year, one every quarter, but uh, on demand, they can, uh, they can increase. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the good. shipping. And just another note there on a, some owners actually take their own boats and the 70 foot uh, motor yacht I described earlier, they, um, they had some works carried out here in Phuket before they, before they left. And um, they've just taken three and a half months 
to sail from Phuket at their own leisure. So they've done lots of surfing. They've done lots of diving. They went to Komodo to see the Komodo dragons. They call in the Batam. Uh, you know, they've been down to Bali. They've had an absolute whale of a time. And at the moment, they're somewhere in between. Uh, they're somewhere in between Surface Paradise and Sydney. So they should be home in about a week's time. And they left, uh, yeah, three, four months ago. Which which boat was that? That was the uh, Outer Reef 70. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the Australian owners, uh, they were very happy with the, uh, the, uh, contractors that uh, we recommended to them, uh, and the surveyors we recommended to them, you know, we've got, uh, Australian, European, uh, surveyors here, uh, which again are listed on our website, the, uh, the favorites. Um, so yeah, as again, we've, uh, we've got all the services that are needed. Very good. Sorry, hang on. <laughs> Don't know why it does that. Right. We are about to go on now and talk about the cruising ground. But I think before we get into the pretty pictures and the, 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 the joys of sailing in Asia, we might just go to a couple of the questions, if that's all right, the questions that are relevant to imports and taxes and so on. So um, one there is, uh, and we've sort of talked about this, Patrick, but Simon has asked further, this, does this mean any boat you buy overseas and you flag to Australia, you're liable for GST on return to Australia? You're on mute, Patrick. Yes. Yes, I agree. I mean, and it's um, not just GST, it's duty as well, correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. Do you is that duty that? on new? Is that on second hand as well as new boats, Patrick? No, it's uh, uh, on new boats. There is a, a caveat there where you can bring a boat built in one of the trade agreement countries uh, 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 back into Australia and avoid import duties if they come directly from that country into Australia, usually right. on a cargo or something. So it means what uh, New Zealand means, China it means any of those countries with uh, uh, a trade agreement with uh, with Australia. But uh, on a used boat, uh, uh, you're very likely to have to pay the import duties, even if it has been built uh, uh, in one of those countries, because the rules are, are very difficult and severe. I would rather tell you you have to, and maybe if you find. Uh, 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 if you're lucky there with the custom, custom broker, not but the custom agent at the time, you uh, may be able to have a case there, but it's going to be very difficult. So I do know the answer to this next one. It's a good question, but I'm going to let you answer it again, Patrick. Do you pay tax? And this is Simon. Thanks for asking good questions, Simon. Do you pay tax on the purchase price overseas or the revalued price if you return to Australia in five years' time, for example? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, indeed, if you buy a boat overseas and you come back into Australia within 12 months, it's going to be on your purchase price. So your bill of sale, which is the, the, uh, the ownership uh, document, the change of ownership document, this is the price which you will have to pay taxes on. If it's beyond this 12-month uh, 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 limit, then it will be evaluation done on site by a proper surveyor who has been acknowledged by um, border force so needless to say there it's going to be pretty much um, the market value of the boat there anyway you won't be able to negotiate there much the guy is very tied customs uh, are getting smarter and smarter there as well they look at prices overseas and everything so there is no much way there to uh, uh, gain a bit. And the other thing I'd like to add is if you have imported the boat into Australia, paid your taxes, and you resell the boat within 12 months, then uh, the amount of taxes may have to be adjusted. You have to declare the value that you sold the boat to, to Border Force, and they may have to reassess. If you're lucky, you get a credit. I've seen it before, but uh, in most cases, you have to pay a little bit more to adjust to uh, if, if the valuation, say, of your importation has been 
below the price that you managed to get when you resold the boat afterwards in Australia, you have to adjust the taxes. So this is border force capturing those people who say, right, I'm going to go to the Caribbean and buy that boat that's really cheap, sail it to Australia, pay as less uh, tax as possible, and then I'm going to sell it for a pretty penny. And then so the border force are onto that, obviously. They're saying, okay, Correct. that's all right. You can do that, but we want a bite of the cherry. Correct. <laughs> Okay, hey, they don't miss a trick. All right. But the rules are a little bit different. We were talking about Australia. I mean, we could go on and on, but just briefly, on in in New Zealand, there is uh, 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 it is way more attractive because uh, in New Zealand, no matter what, it will be on the bill of sale of the boat. So, say you bought the boat five years ago in overseas, wherever you bring your boat as a Kiwi back home. Uh, you will have the benefit of a depreciation of 10% of, uh, for any full years since you bought the boat there on your bill of sale. So that's a, a you know, massive benefit that our uh, colleagues there in uh, New Zealand can enjoy. But uh, I'm happy to go into more details of specific countries on a case-by-case -case there after that meeting. Yep. Very good. And then, Paul, I just uh, a yeah. <clears throat> question of my own here. Um, do you find that most of the boats that you're listing and selling are what we would call, and you see it all on the brokerage websites, uh, boats that are called taxes unpaid? So boats that have been cruising the world in between all the different jurisdictions, yeah. staying for just the right lengths of time and then arriving and, and being listed for sale by you as a taxes unpaid boat? Yeah. Um, and I would say that the majority, at least more than half of the boats that we are selling are, are foreign flagged vessels. Um, so, yeah, the majority of them are taxes unpaid. Uh, I think recently we had a, a, a German client who had paid his taxes in Germany, but the boat was in, um, in Phuket. But those taxes, as Patrick said earlier, would not become applicable unless the boat was bought by a German and he was taking the boat back to Germany, which uh, seldom happens. And then the reason we ask that is because when you look at all the brokerage websites and you see the boats that are listed as taxes unpaid, they are normally listed for a slightly lesser value. And that's because the buyer, the seller is not trying to recoup the taxes they've paid on top mm. of what they paid for the boat. So yeah. my understanding is that in brokerage land, a boat that has remained taxes unpaid is often going to be a slightly better, uh, sometimes a, a smarter purchase because you're not, the seller isn't trying to reclaim their taxes. Sure. Yeah, okay. So it's clearing that one up. And then also, just before we jump on the cruising areas, Thai marinas that we were talking about, uh, this is from Nathan, uh, What's their rules in terms of liverboard in the marinas? And also what's the rules or what's the approximate costs of marinas uh, in, in Thailand? Uh, and sleeping aboard is uh, it's commonplace. Uh, it does happen in uh, quite a few of the marinas. Um, so yeah, there's not a problem there. Uh, I think the easiest way for me to answer Nathan, uh, Greg, is if he just... Uh, wants to drop his uh, email address down and I'll uh, I can forward him all of the rates per foot and you know if he gives me the the dimensions of his boat or I can just give him the, the information direct from each marina all right and so I think if anyone does want to know what the cost of marina berthing is don't be uh, shy just uh, drop us a message and we'll because yeah. it is it's a bit of an open-ended question at times yeah about how much of marinas so if you've got a specific question on that we can't answer it but we just like to know a bit more detail. Okay, so let's get into the fun um, I had a quick comment there from uh, yes. one of our colleagues, the broker. They, he uh, reminded that uh, uh, those taxes that we were talking about specifically in Australia are payable on the boat plus the costs of the delivery. So if you ship the boat across on a cargo ship, it's going to be the boat that you pay, I mean, the price that you paid for the boat plus the cargo delivery costs all the way to Australia. If it is, um, uh, you know, on her own bottom, then it'll be some fuel costs and everything that you have to add there as well. So uh, uh, 
as you said earlier, Greg, they're really onto it. But that's a really good point because that's the same with any of the new boats that we sell, uh, that we always have to add the shipping to the uh, calculation for duty and GST. So, yeah, so it's important to remember that if it's a brokerage boat, if you're picking it up in Thailand, putting on a ship, add the value of the shipping to the boat for the calculation. Good questions. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to get into the, the fun stuff. We're going to talk about the cruising grounds. Okay. And sorry, and just on that, I think it's on the last leg of the trip, isn't it, Patrick? You know, when you're trying to calculate if you've sailed the boat or delivered the boat yourself, if you were going to Bali, it would be on the, the cost of the leg from Bali to Darwin, wouldn't it? Is that true or false? Yeah, correct. From the, yes. the, the, the time that you purchase the boat and then your arrival there. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the last leg, yeah, sorry. It's not on the last the leg. Yeah. If you go cruising around the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah so you, on the last leg. Yeah, so you can sail down the, down through Thailand and, and, and Indonesia and do all that. None of that. It's just that it's where the last country that you checked out of across into Australia. That's the cost that they want to know about. So that was Rachel, I think, who pulled that one up. Thank you, Rachel. Okay. Um, let's talk about the cruising area, Paul. Yeah, so I mean, 18 years ago, when I first arrived here, um, as an instructor and a, a, a charter skipper, uh, I just was blown away by the cruising ground in between Phuket and Pangna Bay down to Langkawi, and even a little further than that. Um, just you can do so much every single day, you know, and I think this is, you know, part, as you said at the start, it's part of the idea is, you know, why not? enjoy the beautiful cruising ground that you probably many Australian buyers, for example, or even European buyers, they may never have seen. And we've got so much to see on the doorstep and it's uh, very cheap. Uh, and again, one thing that we talked about last week in Australia, you haven't got the capacity to uh, drop your anchor or take a mooring boy and then literally just take your dinghy, go ashore and eat dinner. And that's what cruising around uh, Thailand and Malaysia and Indonesia is all about. And there's hundreds and hundreds of uh, beach restaurants around Phuket. And it's just nothing better than just uh, dropping your anchor on a white sandy bottom and either swimming ashore or, uh, you know, taking your dinghy ashore and going and eating some beautiful Thai food and a few beers. It's, uh, but Phuket to Langkawi is, uh, it's up there. It's absolutely outstanding. Um, but as I said, I mentioned earlier on about this big 70 foot boat, they wanted to cruise. And there's Pangna Bay, very sheltered, very beautiful. But they took four months to sail all the way through the region. Um, and I think, you know, they stopped off at Singapore um, for a, about four days and did some shopping. They went on to, uh, they went up towards Borneo and caught a Kinabalu. They came back down and went to Komodo. Um, you know, they sailed, uh, they went across to Jakarta and left there uh, pretty quickly. Apparently they didn't like that. So, but then they get down to Bali and had a great time in Bali, uh, you know, and just uh, done so much diving, beautiful, beautiful islands, and there's no one around. It is absolutely empty. And if it isn't, just around the corner, there'll be somewhere where you can enjoy it. And they they checked in at Darwin. They had some uh, maintenance and some uh, reprovisioned in, uh, in Darwin at Cullen Bay. Uh, they stayed there for about a week. And then they headed off over the Gulf of Carpentaria and now they're doing the East Coast. So, I mean, back nearer to home around Phuket, uh, off to the west side there, we've got um, the oh, Similan sorry. Islands, the Surin Islands, which I know we've got slides in here. But firstly on Pang A, as I said, it's very sheltered, um, a very short stops. I mean, you can literally stop every 10 minutes. There's something else to see or another a hong, which is a, a the, the Thai word for a cave or a room. Um, you can escape the crowds. I and mean, this point here, it's uh, James Bond Island, which was used in uh, the Man with a Golden Gun movie. Um, there's lots of crowds there. But, you know, as I said, just around the corner, there'll be no one. So, you know, you can also, these, uh, these long tail boats, uh, traditional Thailand uh, water taxis and fishing boats and you know, you're sailing through Pangha Bay and the uh, the fishermen are holding up uh, prawns and uh, squid and you can buy it fresh uh, straight from them and use your barbecue. Fantastic. Otherwise, Paul, as I said, there's, there's Paul, hundreds of restaurants too. So it's great. And my, my background was 
many years ago in the, the, the yacht charter business as well. Yeah. I, I remember, I think for a lot of Australian and New Zealand clients, especially Australians who've chartered and sailed the Whip Sundays where they rent a boat and sail, or even people who are sailing their own private boats up and down the Australian East Coast, you generally have to do massive provisionings in, in, on, the, on the mainland towns and so on because there really isn't any facilities out on the islands other than if you go into the resorts. Mm -hmm. The thing about cruising the, the Thailand and, and Malaysian cruising areas and probably most of Asia, to be honest, is the fact that wherever you anchor, you go ashore and there's normally a restaurant, uh, a beach and, and good quality restaurants. And, um, but just that whole food and beverage experience that comes as part of the sailing experience is, I think, the point of difference often. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll just come over here. So yeah, I just wanted to point out, this is for Phuket, uh, the seasons, by the way. So the high season here in Phuket is uh, December. We're just uh, starting our high season now, and uh, hopefully the rains have, uh, have all gone because it's been an exceptionally wet year. But December to April is typically uh, the high season here in Phuket with a, with a northeasterly breeze. Uh, it's, the, it's a sunny, sunny time of year, but it's a slightly cooler time of year as well. Um, the real hot, hot, um time is april april may where the humidity uh, increases but that's the start of the southwest monsoon which runs through to november so uh the seasons there's two seasons basically one's uh, hot and dry and one's hot and wet <laughs> um if anyone is cruising this area as well there's a fantastic publication which is uh, the andaman sea pilot this is, was uh, written by a, an australian uh well, he was one of the writers, uh, Bill O'Leary, along with uh, Grenville Fordham. And uh, there's uh, some amazing photography and uh, great anchorages and information in that book. Um, it's written by all expat skippers, but it's uh, it's well worth uh, buying or it's uh, it's available online now as well. But it uh, covers this whole region all the way along to uh, PNG and uh, Northern Australia. Very good. And uh, in... Thailand, the if you're the, the, so where you're talking about there is Phuket for those seasons. But as soon as you flick over into the Gulf of Thailand, it's the opposite way around. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like Koh Samui, for argument's sake, in December is the, usually their wettest month, and yeah. uh, December here is the start of our dry period. Although, you know, December it does often rain, but uh, January, February, March, on you know, on the whole, they're pretty dry months. Okay. That's an aerial view of Pangna Bay. Yeah, absolutely stunning. Krabby. Yep, we got uh, Krabby is a two hour drive. It's probably uh, in, a, in a power boat, it's about the same length of time, but uh, in a sailing boat, you can sail from Phuket across to Krabby in, uh, in a day. It's very popular. Um, fantastic anchorages, beautiful cast limestone landscape lots of bars and restaurants it's not as busy as phuket but uh it's it's half as half the size half as busy very good yeah pp is uh is in um krabi province as well again lots and lots of uh restaurants nightlife pp is where everybody wants to head to but uh it does get quite busy in the peak season but it's an absolutely stunning place is it fair to say, though, at the moment, uh, post-COVID, that, uh, and I don't want to make out that it's dead quiet, but it is a bit quieter because uh, the, I think China, for instance, is still closed, so that you don't have as many of the, the Chinese tourists at the moment. Is that correct? No, that's correct. I mean, uh, it, it was very, very quiet, but um, in the last six weeks, there's been a huge uptake Um there's a lot of tourists in Phuket at the moment, and I would say, uh, in comparison to previous years pre-COVID, uh, I would say it's running at about 65%. Um, it, it's very busy. The roads, you can see on the roads, the traffic's increasing, but uh, the business is coming back, you know, which is good for the charter companies. Uh, it's good for the sales companies with people with uh, their second and third properties around the world. They're, they're back, you know, and they're, they're buying boats, uh, new and uh, new and uh, pre-owned very good 
yeah, again, the Simulans, 55 miles off the coast of Phuket. Um, there's some fantastic diving uh, to be had. And uh, even beyond the uh, Simulans, there's a very popular um, fishing ground where, you know, people go for marlin on specialist tours. But uh, the Simulans are just uh, to die for. It's paradise. <laughs> Again, slightly north of the Similans, you've got the Surin Islands, which again, it's a, it's a few days trip, but uh, this is heading towards uh, Burma or Myanmar. Um, the Surin Islands, again, it's just untouched beauty, you know, and there's uh, native people around here. And uh, again, native people in, uh, in Myanmar that uh, they just can't believe they see a boat pull up. You know, it's just amazing. Yeah, again, up to Myanmar. This, you need special um, passes to uh, to get entry into Myanmar. But again, it's something that can be sorted out here through ourselves, or we put them onto an agent. Um, yeah, and there's some uh, some fees to enter there by sea. But again, absolutely stunning, stunning cruising ground. Again, down to the uh, west coast of Malaysia. This is uh, down in Langkawi, where there are three marinas and a lot, a lot of uh, mooring boys and anchorages. Beautiful island. There's 99 islands in the Langkawi group. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a different uh, experience to Thailand, but uh, one that if you've never seen, it's well worth the trip. And uh, beware of the monkeys. There's lots and my, of my favorite experience there is the floating fish restaurants. Yep, absolutely brilliant. And again, the prices compared to uh, a lot of what expats are used to, it's uh, it's it's cheap. But uh, after Langkawi down to Singapore, um, I would say that the 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 coastline, the west coast after after Langkawi, is uh, it's a little industrial. It's good for the marinas in uh, in Pangkor, in Penang, um, and even in um, Port Dixon, and then down to Putari Harbour opposite Singapore. But uh, the east coast, which I think is on the next slide, uh, the east coast of Malaysia is uh, fabulous cruising too, if uh, if people get the chance to go there. And Malacca, is there marinas in Malacca? Yeah, no. Not really? No. Usually no. sail past Malacca with all due respect. But, <laughs> uh, but the east coast, the east coast of Malaysia, you know, the Perenthian Islands, Tiaman, Terengganu, Redang, uh, just, yeah, it's it's beautiful and uh, you're in very close proximity as well to another great dive site called the Anambas Island Group um, and again you know you're down to uh, near Singapore you have Batam and Bintang just uh, just across the way there. So correct me if I'm wrong but that the beauty there as well is if you were cruising and you wanted to have visitors fly in to join you with you it's not that hard to get to from Singapore or, or wherever no, correct? Absolutely I mean you can uh, I pulled in at uh, Tiamen some years ago and uh, we anchored there for a couple of days and someone flew into Kuala Lumpur and then uh, took an internal flight from KL and landed in Tiamen, which is a, a hair-raising uh, airport. But uh, yeah, for sure, Singapore, KL, Bangkok, Phuket, you know, they've all got international airports. Very good. And okay, then again, so that, that, that slide... Some... Sorry, mate. All right. That, that slide's an interesting one because that's where our marina, our office is in Singapore, yeah? Yeah, that's uh, one degree 15 marina on Sentosa uh, where we have our office and uh, manned by Mr. Daniel Au. Uh, it's a great spot. I mean, some people, you know, they're, uh, they love the beaches and they hate the cities, but, uh, you know, if people do want a city break, um, it's 550 miles, you know, to... It's probably a five-day trip from Phuket, dropping your pick or uh, using the marinas each night, but very good marina. And, uh, you know, you're 10 minutes away from one of the most vibrant city centres in the world. But there's multiple marinas in Singapore, yes? Yeah, there are, well, there are four main ones, but there are other couple that are just used for locals. So, you know, you've got uh, uh, Raffles Marina is on the, on the north side. Um, you've the got... Uh, the Yacht Club... Yep, right, there's uh, marinas all over the island. And um, that marina we're looking at there is when it's on, that was where the Singapore boat show was held, right? 
Correct. The Singapore Bog Show is usually around about uh, April time, which is a Thai holiday time, but uh, that's going to be on again this year, uh, all being well. And just uh, watch this space. We'll probably be exhibiting a couple of our bots there, hopefully. Very good. Again, uh, through Indonesia, just untouched, unspoiled. Um, just beautiful anchorages all the way along down to Australia, as many of the people have been doing lately on the route. Now, well, I'm just going to stop you there for a minute. We've just have a little break from the geography cruising yes. list. A couple of questions, Paul. Yeah. Um, one, and, and we've got a, a, a great supporter of ours and us of him, John Hembrow, has tuned in and he's asking some great questions as always. Um, he's asked, guys, a couple of questions. Some people have said that security is an issue when cruising in Southeast Asia. Any thoughts on that, Paul? Well, we often come up with the, you know, when I used to work uh, as a, doing a cruising uh, a briefing for uh, for guests coming to charter for a week, you know, they all seem to come out with the same question. Uh, there have been, I think, two instances in 20 years uh, in, you know, around Thailand and Malaysia. They're very few and far between. Um, and I, I would say, I was go as far as to say that, it's probably similar numbers than everywhere else in the world. But uh, I've sailed here for many, many years and I've never had any security issues at all. Um, I think there was a boat, a charter boat stolen about two or three years ago where uh, some guys stole a boat from Phuket and they sailed it all the way to Australia and then got arrested. Um, but as far as uh, pirates and the like go, Nah, it's it's they're few and far between, and as I said, two in twenty years. That's not bad numbers. And then, um, is communicating with the locals difficult when cruising away from the main tourist destinations? Is there much of a language barrier? Yeah, there certainly is. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of people are looking for uh, for food, for drinks, or for water, or for fuel. You know, and uh, it's a bit of a universal uh, language when it comes to those four four matters but um yeah for sure i mean in that just in that uh that map there you know the 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 number of languages that are there it's yeah it's going to be an issue but you make do part of the fun part of the fun part of the beauty of it all and then um i know the answer to this one but i'll let you answer it um do you uh is your region affected by cyclones obviously not but i'll let you explain uh the um the cyclones or typhoons that are usually come across in September, uh, basically on that stretch in between the Philippines and uh, Vietnam uh, and up to Taiwan, sort of that uh, kind of area. We do certainly get spin-offs. Uh, we do experience extreme squalls. Um, uh, and also on the Western side, uh, you have uh, Myanmar uh, and going up to uh, Bangladesh and India they often get hit by uh, tropical storms as well. I think uh, the strongest uh, winds I've experienced in Phuket are probably around about 50 knots. Um, that's about as strong as it gets, but uh, actual typhoons passing, we don't get them in Phuket. Or touch wood, we haven't had them in, uh, in Phuket. But yeah, they're concentrated mainly uh, out in the, the Andaman and uh, in between the Philippines, Vietnam, Taiwan. The general rule of thumb, I think, is that if you're around about 10 degrees north, in between the band of 10 degrees north and 10 degrees south of the equator, you should hopefully not have to be experiencing uh, cyclonic activity. But um, I know that, that things have been a bit weird like that lately with some of the cyclones or typhoons yep. up in the Philippines have been forming a little bit within the 10 degree line. So, yep. yeah. Yeah. But so, and your latitude in, in Phuket, I think, correct me yeah, eight, eight degrees north. Eight degrees yeah. north, yeah. Yeah, okay. Hope that helps there, uh, John. So thanks for the question. And then uh, Nathan has asked a question going back to brokerage sales. Do you notice a difference or a fluctuation in your listing prices and so on or, 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 or the volume of sales by season? Mm, that's an interesting point. Um, 
But is there a right <coughs> time of the year? Uh, Actually, I, I don't. I don't think we do. Um, I mean, that's been proven over the last two years during COVID, where you know we're averaging about a fortnight. Uh, yeah, there are little patches. I mean, at the moment, December's usually quiet, and I know times have gone a little bit uh, awry, but. Uh, December and Christmas is usually, I'm sure you'll agree, Greg, it's a quiet time for normal boat sales. But this last two weeks, it's been absolutely crazy. So yeah, yeah. there isn't a real pattern to it. I think uh, prices are, are worldwide now, uh, uh, and they're not really affected by, by any seasons. Uh, uh, you may find more boats in Europe uh, uh, after the summer, of course, when people have finished cruising and some of them will uh, uh, think twice or have some other plans and move on and put their boats on the market so you see a few more there uh, uh, you see quite a few in the Caribbean prices sometimes are a little bit higher in the U.S. but the boats are heavily equipped there with aircon gen set and they're also 110 volts so it's a bit different but um, otherwise I we haven't seen many fluctuations over time in terms of seasons. Now, keeping you on the line, Patrick, this is a question we get, always get asked in these webinars about brokerage. Do you offer buyer's brokerage services for boats not on your website? And is that an additional cost to the purchase price? Yeah, look, uh, uh, I think uh, it is a great service that we offer as a broker. By a broker, we are happy to assist uh, anyone looking for a boat overseas and so who can benefit from uh, or uh, experience or a network to help him negotiate the right price, get access to the boat and follow the right process, use or tools there, the escrow account and everything. Um, Price-wise, if uh, uh, you let us make the first contact with the selling broker, we should be able to... Uh, sharing the commission there with him. If there's nothing there available uh, or he doesn't want to share with any other broker, well, then we'll come back to you and ask you whether you are uh, happy to pay something extra for or service. So uh, we can go there on a, on a case by case basis, but yes, I think it is a, a great facility or service that you can benefit from uh, the broker in your area who can help you find the right boat for you and we've got uh, uh, on our website there i'm happy to send the link but there is uh, a lot of uh, information about that uh, service that we offer what it entitles and how to make it work very good um nathan did ask another question but i'm going to i'm actually going to leave that one alone i'm going to let um patrick maybe come back directly to you about that one nathan um John Hembrow, so we're back into talking cruising now because John's obviously um, runs all the down under rallies and so on. So, and he's done a lot of cruising. So he's asked a good question here, Paul, mm -hmm. um, because when they're sailing all around the Pacific, it's all about taking presents and everything for the villages and so on. So he says, what do you suggest you should carry aboard by way of gifts when arriving at an anchorage with a village? Have you come across that uh, around Asia, Paul? uh i'm afraid i haven't um i mean my cruising probably stops when you get down to uh, batam i haven't uh, gone through there too far uh and even in uh, in burma i uh, didn't come across any villages so i'm sorry yeah i'm afraid i can't help you there john you probably know more than me so if there is anyone uh, watching the webinar today who has cruised through the indonesian area specifically uh or the philippines the uh, western philippines let us know if that that is something that you do like we do when we're out in the Pacific. And <laughs> A very good other... point of contact, though, Greg. I could uh, strongly recommend uh, the marina manager at uh, Nongsa Point in uh, Batam. Fantastic marina, lovely guy. Is there Prakesh ready? And I'm sure Prakesh will uh, be able to give him uh, advice on uh, what villages and gifts and uh, the like uh, can be sought from him. Also, are there any customary ceremonies that should be followed when visiting like there are in some of the South Pacific countries? So again, you, you, th these are questions that might be best found in the, the cruising guides. But Yeah, the Andaman cruising guide is very good for that. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of uh, Islamic uh, regions where, you know, you should respect uh, people not just going ashore in swimsuits and at least uh, 
cover up. I think that's the uh, most respectful one that uh, should be adhered to is uh, the dress code. And again, the, we talked earlier on one of the earlier slides, we've got the cruising guide, but a, another great source of information is a, 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 a forum, um, a website forum for cruisers called Noon Site. And I'm sure those sorts of questions could be answered on Noon Site. Yeah. And um, is navigation easy, chart accuracy? Two more questions there for you. Yeah, there, is, uh, there are definitely some uh, slight variances on charts. You've got to be a little bit careful. Uh, you know, very often you look at your GPS after you've dropped your anchor and you're actually uh, shown as being on land. Uh, it's not too far out. In some cases, I'd say it's about 50 to 100 metres. But, uh, yeah, you just got to be careful and use your charts. <laughs> very good. OK. Um, so um, I'm just going to flick to the next slide. OK. Oh, sorry, we're up to Q&A. Patrick, yeah. are you able to see the questions? Yeah. Yep. Could, did you see that one from Nathan about um, the unfair question? If you could have a read of that, just let me know if you want to just answer that one directly to, to Nathan or whether you want to answer it now. And then um, because we've been answering questions as we've gone, we've actually answered all the questions we have, uh, unless there's something I've left behind. So Pat, uh, Rachel, maybe let me know if you think I've missed one. I think we've done a pretty good job of just answering the questions as we go. Is there anything else you've thought about as you've been talking through this today, Paul, that you're now going, oh, I need to talk about that? No, I just think if anyone uh, has any doubts about Phuket, then please come and try it because uh, I can strongly recommend after living here for 18 years, uh, it's a fabulous place. And, uh, you know, fellow uh, industry partners uh, we've got here in Thailand, many who I've worked for and worked with, have been here from France, from Australia, from America for uh, 20, 25, 30, 35 years, you know, and they're uh, they're still here in their 70s now, but uh, they're all very good to tap into advice, like the likes of Vincent Tabator, Andy Dowd and Bill O'Leary, Grendel Fordham. There's just a massive knowledge uh, around. So uh, I've tapped into their knowledge and uh, like to spread it to our clients as well. And Paul, if, anyone, if anyone's got any questions, though, please contact uh, directly or call by the, uh, the Bolt Lagoon office and see me at any time. And, Paul, you speak Thai, right? Uh, a little bit. Okay. I wouldn't say I'm uh, proficient, but, uh, yeah, uh, Thai's okay. <laughs> so there was one other unanswered question. It was from Rich Taylor earlier. It was about being domiciled in mainland China. Uh, Rich, with that one, I'm going to get Patrick or, or Paul to come back directly to you on that one after. Um, I and thought then, you yeah. might be uh, best suited there because you know a little bit more about China than we do. But... Yeah, yeah. so we, we can answer that. Um... But look, uh, no, on, on his unfair question, there is no unfair question. It's pretty <laughs> simple. Uh, we are there, uh, obviously, in between a buyer and seller. And uh, who are we favouring to uh, earn or commission? It's not an unfair question. We want the deal to happen, and uh, we are there as a, as a go-between. So we bring the boat to the market. We bring the offer from the buyer, and uh, we are trying to negotiate the right price between the two parties. At the end of the day, we are instructing, or we are advising, better said, the seller to uh, the, the market price that he should list the boat at, sometimes often they're not uh, that uh, reasonable and they want to get a bit more or they think the boat is the best in the world and they're asking for for more so we try to be fair ourselves there in between and uh, usually advise or clients with the uh, market prices and everything but uh, it'll be a game we pass on the information on both sides and we help negotiate to find the best outcome for both parties it goes, uh, you know, it takes two to dance there. And uh, if one uh, feels that it is not fair for him, it doesn't go uh, away. I mean, doesn't go ahead with the deal anyway. I hope Very that good. Fair. And then um, financing for residents in Thailand who are, so for expats, can expats get finance in Thailand to buy a boat, Paul, from your experience? No, they can't, unfortunately. Uh, it's been a question that's been asked many times over my uh, stay here. Um, the Thai banks will uh, basically finance what they see as an essential item, i.e. a house or a car. 
cars classed as essential, but um, I've had one uh, Thai person who has managed to source financing through a bank. Um, I don't know how he did it, but expats go into a bank, they will not get uh, credit, I'm afraid. Okay, very good. I think well, I, I can help there a little bit as well, if you allow me. Um, uh, financing is, is a recurrent question that we get from a lot of our clients. Unfortunately, obviously, for those overseas, there is no financing that we can offer to someone who is an overseas resident. You have to check with your own bank. Uh, uh, for more experience, there are not many tools unless you have plenty of assets and you're just uh, cash poor on the day. You will probably get some help from your bank. But unless you live overseas, like in Europe, where they have some very... Um, uh, exciting tools there with the leasing and everything. It's a, it's a very poor option that you find usually in uh, in all latitudes there. It's it's not very well suited. So, in other words, if you don't have the money, you won't get financing. And another great question just came in right at the last minute there from a client I know called Rod. Um, He's going, uh, how difficult is it to get insurance? I'm led to believe it's getting more difficult for many cruising grounds. Great question because it does come up a lot. Um, how do you go, Paul, over there in, in Phuket think, uh, selling the boats? The last few years, there's been an increase in, uh, in insurance premiums, for sure. Um, I know that uh, some of the insurance companies have become reluctant in insuring uh, older boats, especially older wooden boats. Um, and I think, you know, with COVID, there's been a lot of uh, boats that have sat still for two, three years that have experienced uh, issues recently because the owners or operators have turned up just expecting to turn the key and the boat's going to work fine. But we all know that doesn't happen. But yeah, I mean, there's some very reputable uh, companies. I did see the email, but we thought we'd keep all the questions in here. Um, I will answer that question with um, two or three uh, insurance representatives and companies here in Phuket that I could uh, recommend to him. But my understanding also, Patrick and Paul, is that now the insurance companies, are they, I think they call it fluid insurance, which is where they, your premium quotes or your premiums will change depending on where your yacht is located. And, and for instance, I have a lot of boat owners at the moment. I say, oh, where are you? Oh, yeah, we're, we're anchored happily on the Gold Coast. Uh, we're, it's, we're not allowed to go north at the moment. And so what that is, is the insurer is saying, you have to be further south than a certain point uh, because you're not allowed, because we probably won't insure you if you want to sail up into the cyclone region at this time of year. So it's all about being in the right place at the right time of the year as to whether you do or don't get insurance. Is that, is that how you see it, Patrick? Yeah, I would agree there. It's, uh, they've got a lot of, of parameters there to base their decisions on, uh, but the main rule is, yeah, to stick to your uh, fairly recent production boats if you can, preferably if you would don't want to run into any issues with uh, insurance. Otherwise, it's still possible, but more difficult. I can think of, uh, you know, if you have a custom trimaran, for example, you're going to be struggling there to get a cover. So uh, the rule of thumb there would be to stick to your uh, uh, recent production cuts, preferably new, and call Greg for that. But uh, <laughs> otherwise, um, and also where, you're perfectly right, uh, where and when. So uh, if you're on a cruise now from the Pacific there, say across from uh, uh, Tahiti into uh, Australia, you'll be obviously struggling because it is in full cyclone season. So no one will insure or very few companies will cover you. I don't think any would. So you do it at, at your own risk. So yeah, location, timing, and the uh, best thing is probably to follow the, the, the main trends of people, trade winds and all that going into places where other go as well. That's uh, the easiest to get uh, the right cover. Very good. So I think we've now exhausted all our questions and there's been a couple of uh we have to give a gold star on a couple of our good questions nathan thank you you've asked a, a lot of questions and nathan also said thank you gentlemen for so such good information 
Uh, I think that's been really good. That was exactly what we set out to achieve was to, un what do they say? The fear of the unknown, remove the unknown, remove the fear. That was the objective today. So I think we've removed a lot of the unknown. People now know who to contact if they do have more questions. Uh, it's great for everyone to meet you, Paul, and your team. Um, so yeah, feel free to contact us, feel free to tap into the resource that is the multi hole Solutions and the Yacht Sales Co. Um, we, if we don't know the answer, we'll find it out for you, but uh, it's all part of the service. So Paul, thank you. Thank you. And Patrick, thank you. Well done, mate. Thank you everyone there for uh, following us and uh, being uh, here watching. And Rachel, thank you as always for helping with uh, in the background there with the Q&As and so on. So on that note, we will say goodbye and then we'll um, notify everyone when we're going to do a similar presentation about the same thing in the Pacific. Thank you.